Good evening. Welcome to Hardfire. We're very proud tonight to bring you the first installment of a three-part Hardfire debate on 9-11 conspiracy theories. Now, regular viewers have been through this before, so I'm going to issue my disclaimer. Uh, a host theoretically should be neutral. I am not neutral on the subject of 9-11 conspiracy theories. I think that they are pernicious and baseless. However, one of our guests is going to attempt to show me why I'm wrong. I'd like to introduce both of them to you now. Uh, to begin with, we have Professor James Fetzer. Professor Fetzer has just retired after serving as a professor of philosophy at the University of Minnesota for 19 years. He took a degree at Princeton. He served in the U.S. Marine Corps. He's authored 28 books. The latest, The 9-11 Conspiracy, The Scamming of America, just, just released. It's available, I assume, on Amazon and other outlets. Um, my second guest is probably familiar to you from some debates we did a few months ago, Mark Roberts. He is uh, known in the debunking community as the scourge of the fantasists. He shows up at ground zero to confront the people who he believes are profaning that site. He holds their cherished myths under the cold light of reason. We applaud him, those of us in the rationalist community, and those in the fantasy community who tremble at his approach say that he is a very, very bad man. I'd like to begin. I had a different opening question, but I'm going to change it. Yesterday, we were shocked by uh, horrific violence on the campus of uh, Virginia Tech. Already today, certain conspiracy sites were inventing preposterous fantasies. Uh, can we all agree that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar? In other words, there's, there's no political content to a madman's rampage. I mean, we're, we're on the same page there, are we not? Sure. Sure, from what I've read about the, uh, the case, it appears that a young man was upset with his girlfriend yeah. and killed her and someone else, and then the president, in my opinion, showed very bad judgment and clamped down the campus and allowed him to go on a rampage yeah. and kill some of 30 other students. I see no broad ramifications from this event. Good, yeah. So we're, we're all on the same page then, <clears throat> because I wanted to begin just as an overview. Um, to be yes. If you would allow me, though, just to respond to your general remarks. Sure. I think that it's very difficult for someone like Mark to be a responsible anti-critics of the official conspiracy theory. I mean, the government, after, after all, introduces an account involving 19 Islamic fundamentalists mm -hmm. hijacking four aircraft, perpetrating these atrocities under control of a man in a cave off in Afghanistan. That is obviously a conspiracy theory itself. All right, so we'll, I find we'll explore it, the ramifications it, it, yeah. of that. Your point is well and, taken. Yeah. And, Ron, just to make three very general points that are often overlooked. George Bush himself acknowledged during a press conference in response to a reporter's questions. When asked, did, what did Saddam Hussein have to do with 9-11, he said nothing. Yes. The Senate Intelligence Committee and now the Inspector General for the Pentagon has confirmed that not only was Saddam not in cahoots with al-Qaeda, but he was actually tracking down their leaders to incarcerate and even kill them. And although perhaps Mark is unaware, our FBI, our own FBI last June acknowledged in response to an inquiry from Ed Haas of the Muckraker Report that it had no hard evidence associating Osama bin Laden with the events of 9-11. So our position is if Saddam had nothing to do with 9-11, and if Osama had nothing to do with 9-11, then who exactly is responsible for the death of 3,000 civilians? We believe it's the highest form of respect to their survivors, which broadly includes us all, to discover how and why they died. All right, we're going to handle those points. Uh, I think uh, we, we will agree not to discuss the Iraq war. We will agree that Saddam had no direct role in the events of 9-11, and we will agree to disagree that uh, Osama bin Laden was certainly one of the planners and was responsible for those attacks. But the first point I, I would like to address, um, a rational person never wants to limit reasonable inquiry. 
uh, obviously, if, if a theory has some merit, we want to explore it. Are there some theories that disqualify themselves? For example, a person says, uh, well, you know, the Twin Towers were brought down by uh, eight tiny reindeer with uh, explosives in their antlers. I mean, do we, do we proceed to investigate this? Do we say, you know, the NIST report never mentions reindeer DNA. That's, that's, a, a, so that's a damning omission. Can we rule this out? In other words, is it too silly? for us to waste any time on. Well, I think reindeer games are too silly, but yeah. that leaves a wide variety or yeah. range of alternative hypotheses that require consideration. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's silly if it's, someone says that reindeer with explosives it, it, in indeed. their antlers. It, it, yeah. but there, are, there are a lot of uh, conspiracy theories that I think are uh, worth examining because a lot of people seem to put some credence in them. Um, but they can be dismissed very quickly. That doesn't mean they require a lot of examination. See, but it's that, worth. But it's worth looking at. No one, no one has suggested reindeer, but people have suggested uh, stuff not that's not too far removed in terms of Is science fiction. Is the person who claims that no planes hit the World Trade Center far removed from the person who claims reindeer did it? In other words, Absolutely if, not. if he can believe one, couldn't he also swallow the reindeer sure. theory? And that's really why I'm. I'm here um, on, on your kind invitation, um, which is that people have said to me, why would you do shows with Jim Fetzer? Because he doesn't really represent the center of the 9-11 truth movement. Um, views are, are somewhat off, uh, off the scale, some people would even say. And uh, my response to that is, for one, uh, Jim and his group has been influential. I do get emails from young people in particular who say, hey, these scholars believe this. And look at the list of scholars. Uh, they have some impressive credentials. Um, so, you know, who are you to, say, to, to argue with them? So that's one thing. Uh, the other one is uh, that it's about the methods. It's not necessarily about the conclusion that, that Jim or others have arrived at, but how they get there. Um, and that I really feel that they've abandoned critical thinking, uh, abandoned scholarship. Um, and so that's why I'm here, is to, uh, by the end of these shows, we're going to set that straight. <laughs> we're well, Jim, for I want you to pick up on that and tell, tell well, us briefly, you know better than anyone else, the 9-11 conspiracy movement. Who's in, who's out? Uh, having spent 35 years teaching logic, critical thinking, and scientific reasoning, I would hate to imagine that I had abandoned those standards at mm. this point in time. The fact is that Mark's attributing me, to me a view I do not hold, nor does he, I believe, understand adequately the views that are usually being identified by means of that no plane slogan. For example, yeah. Morgan Reynolds, who's usually identified as a no planer, has been spending a great deal of time studying anomalies in mm -hmm. the visual, the photographic record. It's been very painstaking, and he's discovered a lot of anomalies, some of which appear to represent in the visual record, physical impossibilities. Now, it is possible that the visual record has been altered after the fact, for example, to conceal certain features, possibly in some ignition scenario or something else that needed to be removed from the visual record and that planes still hit the, the, the buildings. Mm -hmm. But his focus is that the visual record raises such serious questions that there's a, a question here. If you look at his chapter in my new book, for example, mm -hmm. on page 144, he candidly accepts that given the evidence we have available, which he is very carefully analyzing here, and I will say, don't underestimate Morgan Reynolds. This man has a first-class intellect. He's not only published six books and served as a chief economist in the Department of Labor and the but Bush administration. But he is an economist. He has no background of whatever Yeah, in but science. he's a serious thinker, and he's used to dealing in quantitative measures, and that's very important here. I would, I would defy anyone to read his chapter there and not be impressed with a thorough, painstaking manner in which he's elucidating these problems with the visual record. And, I'll take and, that challenge. And, <laughs> yes, uh, and, on I mean, page, and, and on page 144. He acknowledges quite explicitly that there are a variety of possibilities as to what happened here and that at this point in time we simply don't know. Now, th this is my problem. Is, is there truly a, a controversy here? I mean, a paper was written demonstrating that bumblebees cannot fly, that it's aerodynamically possible for bumblebees to fly. Now, once you've produced this paper, you have to stop for a moment, take a deep breath, and reflect dispassionately and say, but you know something, they do fly. Uh, 
there goes the paper. Now, when you're arguing that many possibilities can account for the planes striking the World Trade Center, one of them is that planes actually did strike the World Trade Center. Well, that actually, at this point in time, is my belief. Yeah, I but believe, you're not sure. I believe that planes hit the plane center. My assign that, that, a probability that the twin, to it. That the twin you are a towers. probabilist. Let, let, una momento. Yeah, I believe that planes hit the buildings. That in all probability <clears throat> they were military versions of 767s that were used as jet fueling tankers, so they'd carry a larger fuel load for the benefit of, of a more spectacular fireball. Well, but, uh, but I but, but I don't maintain have. at this point in time that I know that for a certainty, in part because much of the evidence I have relied upon in forming that judgment is visual evidence of the very kind whose authenticity Morgan is, is challenging. And there now, are all those inconvenient passenger deaths. Li 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 there are so many questions about the passengers, Ron. Let's take this one step at a time. I now, I have observed footage of a cruise missile heading toward the Twin Towers, of a hypersonic plane flashing by the towers, of planes, a plane flying toward the South Tower and of no plane flying toward the South Tower taken from the same perspective at the same time. Some of this footage is now archived on Judy Wood's mm -hmm. website at drjudy.com for you to review or others mm -hmm. at their leisure. But the point I'm making is not all of this visual record can be authentic. And in fact, based upon very extensive research I've done in the photographic and archival record in the death of JFK where autopsy records were altered, photographs from the autopsy were changed, and even the world famous home movie of the assassination was reconstructed. Well, subjects on which I have published three books, yes, incidentally, but bringing JFK together. JFK scholars don't believe you. They, they do oh, not believe Ron, that the, 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 the group. The, we have definitive evidence of it, believe me. I mean, I, I lay I, out. I lay we're, out we're getting way off the yes, right we, we can't, no, we the can't point talk I'm making, about JFK. The point I'm making is that I have a great deal of experience dealing with evidence that has been faked. In the JFK case, I, case, I'd say more of the evidence is fake than was authentic. And once you sort it out, then it's relatively easy to figure out what actually happened. Okay, okay. This, is, this is so much academic, pseudo-academic doublespeak, I can't really believe what I'm listening to. Um, simple questions. These are simple questions. Um, if you, you want to be gratuitously you, insulting, Mark, you, you can do, do that, but I'm giving answers to questions we're well, discussing. Let, let, let's well, let I'm speak. a New Yorker. Many people I know saw the planes hit the towers. Okay. People I know. Did you saw, hear me say that I said I, I believe no, no, planes no, no, hit the tower, no, Mark? Know, did you hear that? But, you're, but you're, what? And nor did uh, Ron or I say that you are a no planer. We're, we're talking about a theory yes. that that people in your organization support, and you support them. No, that's false. Now you you don't understand the nature of the organization. This is a loose affiliation of scholars. Mm -hmm. Are are the the positions of the society? are represented solely in our press releases. All of us are free as independent scholars to develop our own research program. That's great, but that you doesn't do... mean that we require unanimity on all of these issues. Not what we do agree upon are, are dozens of arguments that demonstrate conclusively, in my opinion, that the government's official account can't possibly be correct. See, now here's where I have a problem. Now you, as a professor of philosophy, you understand the precise use of language. You had Dr. Frank Greening on your radio show last week, and uh, there was a remarkable exchange. I, I wrote it down because when I heard it, I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. Dr. Greening talked about the collapse of the towers, and you corrected him. You said, let's use a more neutral term, and you suggested devastation. Now, I said, perhaps I'm growing senile. Maybe I've reversed this in my mind. And Greening said devastation, and you corrected him and said collapse. No, uh, you wanted collapse corrected to devastation. Now, surely collapse is the neutral term. If I describe someone as having regular figures and you say, no, you admonish me, well, uh, no, I, let's not use this weighted term, regular figures. I prefer to use the more neutral term, uh, loathsome hideousness. What are we talking about? Ron, you're missing the point. Most of no. those buildings was, were pulverized. About 80% of the mass was turned into very fine dust, which mm. meant it wasn't available to collapse. Well, but it did we, collapse. This is, this, we need the buildings this. did collapse. No, the buildings were destroyed, but the mechanism mm -hmm. by which they were destroyed is at issue. We're going to get if into that at, at length. Okay. If most of the buildings turned to dust, was pulverized, as is quite evident from the visual The steel record. wasn't pulverized? Oh, yes, it was. No, it wasn't. Indeed, it was, Ron. We can talk about okay. that if we went through the visual record. We 
will. I think we should start doing that. Even Stephen Jones, even Stephen Jones, the foremost proponent of the use of conventional explosives to bring down the towers, especially he emphasized the use of thermite and thermate as Actually, cutter which type. are not conventional yeah, explosives. Yeah, they are not used in, his, in demolition. In, in his chapter, yeah, Jones in, reveals in that he doesn't American, know anything about demolition. In 9-11 and American Empire, he, his one paper that has been published there by David Ray Griffin and Peter Dale Scott, he acknowledges that much of the steel was v vaporized, evaporated. He says it three different he times. He's simply wrong. He also acknowledges... Well, Ron, you're sitting there and making those assertions. That's not even well, an argument. If May we I make the point that's not even an argument? To deny him is not to even Jim, make an argument. Jim, to we can address that. The specifics. Yes, can we address the specifics? Let's talk about that. You're saying that, and Judy Wood also, I don't, I don't know if Morgan Reynolds has, has weighed in on this, that uh, about 80% of the towers, the steel in the towers, was destroyed, vaporized. Um, you've proposed a variety of of weapons that high tech weapons that might be able to do something like that. Do you have a favorite? Do you have is there a leading contender? Listen, the question is you need a source of energy that is very sophisticated to bring about the effects that are easily observable here. The the massive conversion into mountains of dust here and the fact that by the time now, Frank Green pointed out that by this time, energy source doesn't exist. By the time the buildings are gone, you've got virtually ground-level phenomena. Okay, in, this, is, this, is what, this is what this you, is very this is what you see. Do you yeah. have a favorite? Do you have a, a leading contender for what you believe happened? I'm not accepting that your version is correct, but let's, do you, for what you've observed, what do you think caused that to happen? It's, it's some form of uh, directed energy weapon, almost certainly in the class of new weapons that were developed during the Star Wars research program initiated by, initiated by Ronald Reagan. Something in the, possibly in the laser, maser, plasmoid category, possibly involving antimatter. Well, I was, I was reading about this, and they said that all these weapons can be used against uh, a missile, for example, or conceivably even a smaller plane, because they would heat up the exterior and they would affect the balance systems. They don't yeah. have this tremendous, tremendous energy well, output. Let's talk about the energy that's required. about the energy that's required to do that. I'm, I'm going to accept for now that you're right. That 80 percent of that of the steel in those two towers was was vaporized. Um, I don't believe that at all, but I'm going to accept that for the sake of argument. Um, Judy Wood was making this argument on, in an interview that's on the internet recently. Uh, I think she was being interviewed by a, a physicist, and uh, he said to her, this is a quote, have you done any energy, this is her, her leading theory, I don't know if she created this theory or not, but, but she's a, a major proponent of it. So the interviewer said, have you done any energy calculations at all to get a scale for what is involved? And she said, one of the most remarkable things that I've ever seen anyone in the sciences uh, say, and she's a mechanical engineer by trade. Her job is to apply equations to the physical world and figure out how things work. So the guy says, have you done any energy calculations to get a scale for what, this, what is involved in, in vaporizing the Twin Towers? Her response was, yeah, but we don't need to get distracted by those values. Now, that's kind of like me saying, I'm the strongest man in the world by far. And if Jim said, well, I mean, how much can you bench press? How much can you squat? I said, ah, we don't need to get into that, you know. This is a remarkable statement. This is exactly what we need to get into is what kind of energy. Mark, uh, I was there when that interview took place. It was a deliberate hit piece. He was asking her with questions that were overly precise because she isn't this is not an over, This is not a precise Mark, question, Mark, I Jim. was there. I have this is read a direct the quote. transcript this is and a direct I'm glad quote. reading it. Have you friend. done any energy calculations at all to get a scale for what is involved? Look, yeah, but we don't need to get distracted. Look, what do you think? You're, you're just, just, meeting just, scholars for truth. What kind of scholarship does that represent? She's done her homework, Mark. The, Where point, are her is, calculations? the point is, she's Where are her talking calculations? about. They're not on she's her website. emphasizing at this they're point. Not on their website. There are all kinds of calculations. There's on not her a website, single Mark. calculation on this on her Dr. website. Dr. Greening said Listen, on your radio show that the energy to do, do this does not exist. It can't exist. It's vastly in excess of anything that is conceivable. Well, I guess the buildings are still standing. No, they were knocked down the way NIST explained they were knocked down. Right. The first I mean, thing. Look, I don't want to imply Jim, that you're being a little naive here, but there are all kinds well, of things that exist of which I, you are unaware. Uh, all right, but the first again, thing you have to do is realize that there's a professional directed energy 
society that's been around for over a dozen years, for example. And do any, do any scientists Oops. agree with you who are in those fields? Look, Judy is an expert in exactly the fields we need here. She has but she doesn't reason, publish civil, any calculations. Directed Just energy? Just sit tight. Will you let me answer your question? Okay. She has degrees in civil engineering with a specialty in structural engineering. She has a degree in engineering mechanics, which is applied physics, and she has a degree in materials engineering science. She is the single most qualified person studying these issues in the world today. She also doesn't know the difference she, between an elastic and an inelastic collision, which for a mechanical engineer is as bad look as at you this. can get. Look at this, Robert. This now, here you have out. a wonderful photograph. We're gonna, we're, do you don't have to a hold it up, by the way. Of yeah, the pulverization it. Later. of the pulverization of the building. Now, the, the key point, Ron, is getting from conventional to unconventional modes of demolition. It's very important on all kinds of grounds. Well, we haven't okay, yet but Jim, for we're talking about the energy. We're talking about the energy. Here, away. If I may, yeah. Uh, let's accept that what we're looking at, we're looking at a cloud of, of, uh, of dust and things being ejected from the World Trade Center. This is the North Tower. Uh, let's talk about 80% of that being turned to vapor, okay? Now, if you take uh, the amount of steel that would represent, about 60% of the steel in the towers was in the first 15 floors from the, gra from the mm -hmm. foundation up. 60% of the steel up uh, top 100 floors was about was the rest of the steel, 60, mm -hmm. uh, 40%. Uh, if you take 80% of that 40%, that's 32,000 tons of steel, 64 million pounds. What Jim is proposing is that 64 million pounds was vaporized. What does that mean? That means it's, it's gone through its liquid phase. Into uh, a gaseous into phase. Into a gaseous phase. Uh, first, you have to heat it up to a liquid. You can't go directly to a vapor with steel. Uh, that takes over 5,100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 2861 Celsius mm. to do for iron. We're, we're taking, I'll take the figures for iron as steel. So what you're, what you're suggesting is that we're looking at 64 million pounds that's been heated up to over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the now, energy? What effect, so what effect would that have on everything else around it? Most of Manhattan, lower Manhattan, would be incinerated. Look at the effect you're showing right there. Do you see that, any There's no possible way. People survived. This is a result. Jim, people were in there's this no building There's no possible way. This is a result from a collapse of any kind. It certainly isn't accountable by conventional explanation. So where, it manifestly but, wasn't brought so about again, by you, where are your, account. Where are your figures for that the collapse wasn't possible? Judy Wood hasn't done any. The collapse was what? Oh, no, Judy Wood has. Here's what Judy Wood says. She says that the towers should have taken... 96 seconds to collapse because here's what I was talking about. She doesn't understand for a mechanical engineer to not understand the difference between an elastic and an inelastic collision <laughs> is the most inexcusable thing. I don't think she doesn't understand. I think she's just fudging her figures. Um, she says that what's happening is that each uh, floor collapses, hits the next floor, doesn't impart any energy at all to it, uh, just enough to break it free, and then everything starts down again from zero at 9.8 meters per second, and that happens on every floor, so that by the 90th floor you've got, or the, or the 10th floor, you've got 100 floors that are coming down and stopping at each Look, floor. In other words, there's no accelerating so, mass. Yeah, right, no accelerating mass. Look, there wasn't and, even, uh, there's, so where, there's no, so no where demonstration, the, there's no demonstration that, number one, there was any initiation of any collapse, even on the NIST model. That requires temperatures vastly in excess of any that were present. Even NIST, not after at all. examining 236 samples, steel, mm -hmm. uh, found only three that displayed exposure to temperatures over 500 degrees. Un no, nope, you're, you're totally misrepresenting Underwriters, that. totally misrepresenting Underwriters that. Laboratory had certified the steel up to 2,000 degrees for three no, to four hours correct. without uh, undergoing any damage. Underwriters Laboratory didn't certify, certify the steel. Of course they steel. did, Ron. No, they didn't. They, they didn't certify any steel. No, they didn't. Mike well, of Newman course they of, did. No, Mike Newman of NIST flatly denies that. So does Underwriters Labs. And what did Underwriters Laboratory do? They said we didn't do it. They fired Kevin Ryan because he made the they same representation. No, this is ridiculous. What did Underwriters Laboratory do in relation to the steel? They tested the trusses which are made, which are made uh, out of steel. Talking, oh, they they, they are made out of steel, steel Ron, which, which, which connect, which connect, which connect the steel. You're talking about certifying the steel. It has the same effect. If, if, what you happened, talk, if you want Jim, to get serious about happened? experiments involving the towers, the North Tower suffered a massive fire on the 13th of February, 1975. The exposures, hmm. uh, the, the temperatures were vastly higher then Where do you get that from? After the billing. That's in the New York Times. I've got it on, on all my uh, Oh, I know all about the fire. Reportedly. Jim, it, I know it, all about the 2, fire. Over 2,000 degrees. It enveloped the 11th floor. Two-thirds of it surrounded the core. Did it dislodge? And burned for three hours, and none of the steel had Let to be Let me address that. Let me address that. 
let me address that. Some mm -hmm. of the steel did have to be replaced. The fire was contained to one floor. A little bit of it went up, uh, followed through some channels up into uh, the uh, service uh, cableways, but didn't spread out to other floors from there. Okay, so we're confined to one portion of one floor, not two-thirds of one floor. Uh, it was fought the entire time, that fire. Fire department arrived. It's on the 11th floor. They could get up in there. Uh, stand pipes weren't broken. Sprinklers, were wor uh, sprinklers weren't installed then. Stand pipes weren't broken. They could manually firefight uh, from there. Um, that was a containable fire. Uh, it did some damage to the steel, but the steel had the, the uh, fireproofing had not been knocked off the steel by an airliner crashing through it. Okay, which so, is a, a, an unproven charge and a silly. It's thing not unproven make. whatsoever. If you look at pictures, yeah, yeah, and every, I have everything here. you want to assume is is to be taken for granted. Not, nothing no, to the contrary. no. This I is can a very prove it. Form of I can prove it, Jim. If you want to look at uh, some photos, which I have here, of fireproofing that was knocked off of. First of all, do you accept that fire? can damage big structural steel columns, an office fire, not even jet fuel. Generally fuel. not. Generally not. There are no steel structure high rise has ever collapsed due to fire in the history of civil engineering. Well, how, before you're talking or about after 9-11, you're talking about, research is right, if you're talking about skyscrapers, you could say that these are, every, these are heavy steel, redundant steel structures. You could say that every they're, skyscraper. They're not amenable to Jim. any kind of pancake collapse, and they most certainly didn't come down due to fire. What, what percent? The, the fires, the Ron, very Sorry. simply. Yep. Did not burn long enough or hot uh, enough to cause the steel to even point. weaken, much less burn. Okay, may one I? The, yeah, I just want to interject a point. One, one of the complaints we hear most often, for example, on the uh, James Randi Educational Forum, why do conspiracists go on and on about no fires destroying buildings? No one is saying that the fires destroyed the building. The impact of the planes dislodged fireproofing. The fires themselves then weakened the areas that were now missing the fireproofing, why, why make a claim Look, the, that no one's making? And do you uh, disagree the with that? The We're going were, to have to take were. this debate to our next installment next week. We will be back for the second round of our great debate on 9-11 conspiracies. Thank you. Good night. We'll see you soon.